I'm here to talk about geometry streaming, hardware for software. Uh, on behalf of Metafold, I'm the CTO and co-founder. My name's Daniel. But before that, back to the, to the 90s. You all know this story. Uh, it starts in the 70s when Blockbuster rose to video rental market dominance, culminating in the mid-90s with 9,000 stores globally and close to $6 billion in revenue. And then Netflix. In 97, Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph launched a mail order DVD rental business to compete with Blockbuster and actually did very well. There's often this idea that they weren't doing well at the video rental market. They actually were doing quite well. But it, it was the release of their streaming platform in 2007 that I'm sure 100% of us all, uh, here today use um, that uh, caused their meteoric rise to 232 million users uh, worldwide as of this year, and huge profits as well. And today, the landscape is this. Uh, streaming is the de facto way to access video on demand. Uh, if you're anything like me, you have an assortment of these different streaming services and uh, you flip between them all endlessly before going to bed. Um, but the point is that th the drivers for the video streaming market were things like fast internet, going from 500 megabits up to about a, a gigabit connection, 1,000 megabits, mobile devices, uh, and demand for content. Um, interestingly, Netflix actually uh, did a lot of its growth in the, early, in the late 2000s and early 2010s despite uh, poor video quality. And I, I remember watching YouTube content at very poor resolutions and being very happy about it. And so the proposition uh, to you, and uh, is also what we're working on at Metafold, is that these are the same drivers the same drivers that drove the video streaming industry also are driving the additive manufacturing industry. Um, fast internet, mobile devices. There's so many folks uh, that work from home now and maybe don't have access to that massively powerful workstation. Um, GPU devices are getting hard to acquire and expenses if, expensive if you do. And there's an increased uh, demand for content. And there's one other driver that is made less explicit uh, and maybe less backed out in economic fact, and that is uh, convenience. And convenience is a very powerful force. Um, I was just out of grad school when uh, Netflix really rose to prom prominence. And uh, as, as a student then, and also a, a software programmer, I was very adept at finding alternate sources to video content, like was really good at it. And uh, I switched over like almost immediately, right? Like it's just so convenient to access this from anywhere uh, and quickly. So we at Metafold really adopted this, um, this idea. And the nice thing is that convenience is a, uh, is, is a notion that also motivates some really interesting technical goals. So these are the goals that we had when we were building Metafold. We want to run on any device. We want to get initial results uh, from a query in about 200 milliseconds. So that's about on par with what a streaming service does. Gets going after about 200 milliseconds. Products around uh, our product. And the last one, we want to focus on dense metamaterials. Nothing to do with the video streaming service <laughs> idea. And you may wonder why uh, we're into that, and I'll, I'll get there in a minute. The Early kind of architecture sketches that we worked on uh, in the early days of Metafold led us to this. Um, we wanted to find a good way to deliver content in a way that was good for the human and also good for the machine, a kind of unified geometry representation. And so we built a GPU cloud compute service um, as a way to, to hit all our target goals. So this was a great idea, and, and that's us now. We, we're, a, we're a cloud GPU compute service for the additive manufacturing industry. So why metamaterials? And this is a kind of a crucial part of uh, our business. So 
I was at Rapid last month, maybe um, a lot of you folks were as well, and I observed that, that there were about 90% 90, 90 of all the parts at Rapid and Formnext before it were lattice-based and metamaterials. And I actually did a count today. I kept a little counter. Um, I think we've had about 10 talks today, and nine of them had metamaterials in them. And so I would propose to you that these high-frequency structures, dense metamaterials, are not a nice to have of the added manufacturing industry, but they're in fact a defining trait. Um, and to, to be way more specific, if you're not using microstructures in additive manufacturing, then, then you're missing out on a big part of, of the design space. These are uh, wonderful images actually from, from HP, 3D Systems, BASF. Again, I took these at, at Rapid last month. Just to hit this po point home a little bit more, this is a paper that was out last week, and um, this is phenomenally interesting. The Gibson-Ashby chart is something that all material scientists use, and it, it you know, maps material properties to, uh, on a chart. And this paper, um, one of the big findings is that the, this, this chart and the, the properties that we associate with these lattice structures break down after a certain scale. It's just not accurate once you get to a certain length scale separation. And so again, there's a huge amount of potential in dense metamaterials um, to build new products around, and that's uh, the sort of second big piece of what we do at Metafold. So we want to be convenient, we want to be uh, fast, we want to run in all mobile devices. We also want to do this for dense metamaterials. And this is challenging, and so the next few slides are a little bit about the challenges that we hit um, in developing this tech. Um, a quick calculation. So a pretty standard build size for, um, for a lot of consumer up to industrial printers is about 200 mils in, in a number of directions. And let's just say this is a DLP uh, system or something that works on voxels. Um, at a 4K resolution, this gives you 36, almost 37 billion voxels. And okay, that, that's a big number, but what do we do with this? If you want to design with this, so maybe you want to represent this as a, a sine distance field or, or some other kind of, you want to attach some kind of geometry primitive to the, this, this data size, you're at least looking at something like 132 gigabytes in memory. So this is still well beyond um, your phone's memory, your laptop's memory. Some workstations have this, not many. Um, and it is certainly beyond anything that you would consider streaming. So, to solve this problem, programmers and developers come up with different representations. And so what's a good representation for this kind of data? And this was a central technical problem that we, we've been working on. Um, for those of you that aren't CAD nerds, there's a few very common ways to represent these kinds of shapes. They're broken down into two parts. You have explicit representations and implicit representations. So an explicit representation is uh, something like triangles or polygons. Um, this is the, the, the most well-known and widely adopted uh, representation for you know, reasons unknown in, in 2023. Um, but there it is. Um, also, in more standard CAD applications, you have spline surfaces, so nerves sort of embrace the fact that there are a lot of voxels and go with it. Um, you also have fancier representations like sparse hierarchical grids. Um, and functional representations, which is also uh, emerging as a really useful representation. Uh, I know, Blake, you've done a lot of work on this, um, and others have done a huge amount of work on, on FREPs. The, the point is that the whole uh, dense thing, if you want to get at those material properties that have that length scale separation, um, a lot of these representations uh, don't work well, and you end up, and this is a challenge that we had as well, and still have to some extent, it's very hard uh, not to move the problem around. Um, so for instance, if you look at the picture uh, on this slide, this is uh, quite a dense representation, and you might think that uh, a hierarchical grid or some kind of boundary volume um, approach might work really well here, but the problem is there's always more detail. There's always a finer, uh, beam or another thing that you need to subdivide into. And so the payoff from these structures uh, deteriorates really, really quickly. Um, 
Various file formats do uh, improve matters in the 3MF consortium. Uh, Duan has done uh, amazing work in the technical team in the 3MF consortium. Really great work to, to improve matters on the triangle front, but there's still no free lunch. Like, it, there, the problem is still there, and this problem of compressing and reading dense data still exists. So we opted um, for the streaming approach so that we could not represent the whole structure in memory at once, but rather sort of drip it in as needed. And when this works both for the modeling front and also, and this was a, a key driver from the beginning for Metafold, also at the printer level, which most printers print by slices. That's a great discretization of the shape right there. Okay. So um, this following video is sort of like our acid test for um, the streaming performance. This was done not long ago. Um, and I'm going to hit go. And the first result hits our target. So this is a, um, just a normal browser. I am at my desk. I'm at a wire connection. It's about 500 megabits. Server's in Virginia. I'm in Toronto. And I hit go like this, start a lattice. And boom. So that's streaming in at that level of detail. And now the acid test here is to gradually increase the unit cell count down to the kind of length scale separation where we get some really interesting material properties. So from 20 millimeters down to 10. And you can see all the partial results updating as well. And from 5 down to 2. Compression struggling a little bit. Rendering's getting crunchy, so we increase the, the render resolution. Things do bog down at this point. So we're now at a one millimeter unit cell and about a 200 millimeter uh, boundary box. But here we go. And it's in. It's just on the edge of passable, I think, from a geometry quality side. Not quite. Um, but that's, uh, that's about 3 million unit cells in the browser, streaming uh, real time. And um, you can run this on your phone. There's no compute on the device. Uh, I was trying it here. The uh, Wi-Fi is not great. Cell is even worse. So at your desk with a wired connection if you do want to try it. So that was our first big win, is the streaming architecture. And um, this is for the designer. This is for the user. But the same representation can be used to stream slices to the printer. So we expose a web API that lets you um, do high resolution slices. This is an 8K slice. The second goal um, is to build out a geometry kernel that sits as a web service that hits some of the really kind of gnarly CAD operations that you want to um, do. And so in this example, uh, we're going to start with the lattice in the same way and start to size it up. So uh, a, common, um, a common request is not to use, like always to use the, uh, the circular beam sections. Um, so we have a number of different breaking. Um, but we can size this up. And now we can start to do something really interesting. So we have, our approach lets us do something called redistancing uh, on the fly. Redistancing is normally a really heavy compute problem, even uh, with some of the really great algorithms. And so here I've, I've set up a redistance operator. And the redistance operator is sort of uh, the, the gateway into some interesting CAD operations that are not easy to do. And this, for instance, is a fillet. So this, you can take a, a lattice shape, apply a, a box profile, and you can fillet the whole thing automatically in the same framework. Filleting is one of the crucial CAD moves that removes stresses from the nodes and lets them flow around the node and not get sort of pinch points at, uh, at these structures. Um, a, another common pain point for a lot of implicit modeling is not being tied back to real units. So here's a, a grading of this unit cell. And Often, when you grade the unit cell in an implicit modeler, you destroy real-world measurements. So in this case, we might expect the fillets to uh, also um, distort. But because we're using this redistancing operation, the fillets are exact. So a bit of a deep dive into uh, CAD nerddom. Um, but for any mechanical engineers, this will surely resonate with you. 
The other thing is that the, everything I showed you is accessible through our API, and it works like a REST API. You have a token, and you make requests. This request is just a JSON file. I've uh, exposed this in Python, but this is all that it is. You set up um, the volume, you set up some distance transforms, some, uh, some STLs or design spaces to sample, and you hit go, and you get results back, and you can build your own product with this, your own uh, scalable web-based um, implicit modeler. And we have documentation, and I couldn't you know, show off this at this conference and for everyone as a developer, this is truly astounding. More than the technical achievements is actually getting documentation Whoa. together. <laughs> yes, every call and response in the parameters, it is there for you to read. With the API, though, we can do some really interesting things. So the, the web app is kind of a, a sort of a one-to-one -one relationship between the user and, and the parts. Um, but with the API, we can do bulk queries, and we can process on a single GPU on the web, we can process close to three to 5,000 parts an hour. Um, and this meta ABC is actually a joint work with Yishin Chen of UFT, um, built off the ABC data set. I think Daniele is around somewhere from New York here. Yes. Uh, this is a great data set of a lot of industrial CAD components. If you don't use it, you should. And we were able to bulk process this data set, fill it with um, lattice elements, and uh, you just create, save this out and use it for training applications, algorithm robustness, and so on. So, um, and we found with some of our enterprise clients that this is one of the things that they, they really wanna do, and it sort of unlocks generative design for these, these parts and in internal products or even commercially viable projects that they build. However, all of this, uh, I think, can be summarized, at least for us, this is a recent win. We've been working with the Southwest Research Institute on cell scaffolds. Cell scaffolds are something that our software really excels at designing. And when um, our, the researcher at Swiri came to us, the thing on the left was the prototype that they had. And through our technology and our product, the the researcher could design new cell scaffolds in about four hours and print them without exporting to STL. It was a direct-to-printer streaming integration with Sega um, and out pops an industrially relevant cell scaffold with at least 100 times more surface area. And more surface area means more cells and a, a more industrial relevant part. So for us, all this technology kind of accumulates into this one uh, user success. So thank you. Please try out our application. At <laughs>